Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation with Tom Merritt and Leo Laporte. Episode 20, recorded August 17th, 2011. Chris Markwell. Triangulation is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. It's time for triangulation. I said that with a German accent because we have our great German guest today. Tom Merritt is here. I am back. I'm not the German guest. Though. You're, You're not the German guest. Well, aren't you German? No, it might be a little bit. Oh, mostly like English, Merit? French. Merit? Okay. Yeah. We well, don't usually have a live Irish. guest and triangulation, so this is kind of fun. I hope we can get more live guests in here. But Chris Marquardt is visiting from Germany, and I thought it would be really fun to spend some time with Chris. <laughs> what Chris was just saying it was almost exactly, what, three years ago? Three years ago. Did photo day? <laughs> Well, no, 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 no. Three years ago, you had me in the Twit Cottage yeah. um, for one hour of just photo just like chat. This, yeah. And um, the TriCaster broke. <laughs> so it literally broke. We had actually it's fixed a, it. Yeah, the TriCaster I, disaster. Yeah. It was, I called it the TriCaster disaster. I actually um, had a little audio recorder, so I recorded some audio, put that on my feed, and <laughs> shot some pictures. And um, that's, but, but just looking back, it's three years ago, and look. We've come How a long way, guys baby. Come. I mean, just stepping in here is... This is an amazing place. Thank you. This is such an amazing place. We're pretty proud of it. I'm really happy. You should be. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, I know Chris because, of course, he's a regular on the radio show. We've known each other for some years. How did, I don't even remember how we met. I think we met at Podcast Expo. We met at Podcast Expo. You wanted the N95 that I had. And you were the oh, Nokia N95. That's how long ago that was. Because it wasn't on the market yet. Yeah, I remember those. So he tried to talk me. Hey, John, um, would you run, get me, there's a there's an N93 in my uh, cabinet. Or was it an N93? I think it was, I think it was N93. N93. Yeah. yeah. It was in my, it's in Everybody my cupboard. It looks like a video camera with a mirror. And, and you wanted that and then uh, a, a few on months. On the top shelf. A few months later, I, I started listening to the Tech Guy show. And I noticed there was no photography in there. Right. No photography and whatsoever. And there ought to be. And, oh my God, this is a trip down memory lane. Oh, so I got no. it. <laughs> I finally got it. Yep. This is a, this was a, this is a phone, obviously, a Nokia phone. And a video camera. Look at the, look at the form factor of the phone is really that it's much more like a, a camcorder. Yes. And I was so impressed because you were doing interviews at, the, I think this was the first podcast expo, as a matter of fact. Uh, what's Maybe the, the second? second? What's the second? But it was still in uh, Ontario. It was in Ontario, California. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so I still have this thing, and, and uh, you, you don't still use it. I don't that, use though. it. We've gone on. No, yeah. This is my museum. Well, I was working at CNET at the time, and we were thinking about buying a t bunch of those sure. for for going around and shooting video. And then the uh, and when the iPhone came out, everyone just stopped thinking about that. This was better than the iPhone until recently. I mean, it, it it's, it's a three megapixel Zeiss optics. You know, it's three x. Very good thing. And actually, actually, I managed to produce entire short episodes on that. I, I managed to get uh, a little trailer and a little credits thing on there that actually worked. Took me about so you, four days to get it on the, there, so it would recognize. You would put them. the credit and trailers on it as you recorded. I would edit. No, I would edit the show on the thing. I would no put, kidding. I, I would. I could basically. I mean, that's something with iMovie on the iPhone nowadays. That's a piece of cake. But right. back then, that was revolutionary, it and was. I could upload it from that thing onto. Right. My feed. I was That's so blown the, away that, that you yeah. the But it's also when I found out that you were an early podcaster, Tips from the Top Floor, still doing that podcast. That's the, it's the longest running photography podcast. Since 2005? Two um, April 2005, that's when I started. That's when we started that. uh, Twit. That's when we did the first Twit. So yeah. you, you've been doing this as long as I have. Yeah. So and, and see where you've come, uh, what you've come to, and see what <laughs> I'm. What you're I'm here right to. now. So, uh, but I think what's interesting about Chris is he didn't start as a photographer. No. Tell us about your background. Well, I I started actually. I wanted to become a sound engineer. That was my original, <laughs> yeah, my original calling. And um, then I found out that there is an ear disease in my family. That there was a chance that I would get that. I didn't. No kidding. Um, so, so you thought you might go deaf, so I better not be a sound a sound engineer. It's it's, it's auto. I think autosclerosis. Beethoven yeah. Beethoven had mm. that. Yeah. And I uh, ended. He did up okay though. Well, he did okay, but he didn't hear anything. Mm. So kind of hard on a sound engineer. Yeah. So I made a I made a rational decision to 
go into computers. But by that time, I was already uh, doing lots of photography and kept the, the audio production thing as a hobby, basically, and ended up um, working for HP. What did you do for them? Oh, I, I, I started as a support guy and then in Germany. Made my way, in Germany, made my way up to, um, to account, technical account management for companies and uh, some, some pre-sales account management stuff. So you started the tech support? Just tech support, yeah. Wow. yeah. I'm, I'm, I get this techie side on me. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a the thankless th job, too. The th oh, yes. <laughs> the thing is, there, there are these two sides in me, the, the tech side and the, and the creative side. And I've always tried to, to juggle those two sides. You always have to juggle the, the the left brain and the right brain. Right. That's the two things. Um, and look at look at photography. There are so many people coming at the at photography from the tech side, because these big black boxes with tons of buttons are just that sexy when you are, they are. Uh, a techie. And and then the other side, the creative side, that was always near and dear to my heart. But doing all that and and and. Working for HP and, and learning the business ropes basically enabled me to then start my own company. So you knew even when you were working at HP, you wanted to go continue with the photography. Yeah, I actually had my I had my my production company running on the side while right. I worked there. Right. And um, and then six years ago, um, HP had one of those uh, big. What do they call them? Workforce realignment. <laughs> yeah, that's you got realigned. Eh? Well, <laughs> Europe, Europe. I think there was a big wave in Europe, and um, I was one of them. After surviving like five of them over the years, uh. and uh, that was the point for me when I thought, why not? This yeah. is this is the point where I got self-employed. Yeah. That's a co more common story th than not, where people uh, go through these economic downturns like we're having right now. They lose their job, and it actually gives them the impetus to go start something of their own. I've recently talked to a few friends who all all said the same that it it took this one event for them to finally make that step. I always wanted to do it, but when you are on the when you are in a in a regular job and you get your you get your money every month, it's just hard to pull out. The safety thing is there. And yeah, it's and funny because uh, I think it was at that podcast expo, uh, which must have been two thousand six, uh -huh. that uh, Jason Calacanis gave a speech in which he said this downturn that we're going through back then, which got much worse, is an opportunity for everybody mm -hmm. to sit back, retrain. He says, develop your skills, develop yourself. That's what's so exciting about podcasting is that you can. And, uh, I mean, the podcasting basically enabled this whole thing for me because it gave me an audience, it right. gave me um, a platform to talk to people. And then after, after doing the podcast for a year, uh, I started getting more and more requests from people who asked me if I, if, if I could do that live somehow. The workshops are So amazing. that's, that's yeah. when workshops started. And I did my first workshop in Germany. And... Uh, I had people show up from the United States, from the UK, from from uh, outside of Germany. You know what I love which, about which the was workshops? A big, big eye opener for me. I've, I've never, I'd, I'd never thought that this was such a such a viable you'd pull uh, business people. model, yeah. um, <laughs> and it but it turned into one. Well, Le know. Leo, at that podcast, I don't know if it was that podcast expert, but I remember your keynote was saying, don't do this because you think you'll get rich, right. do it no. because you what? love it, and it maybe you passion. will, right. and that's kind of what you follow, it seems like. It's, it's yeah, but but I only started realizing that after I had done it, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's not like, like I, I, I thought, oh my God, I'm, I gotta do this because I love it. I just did what I love, and mm -hmm. I... That's um, the key. The, the, f the funny thing is now I'm doing things that I would do even if I wasn't paid for them. Like these yeah. ama amazing. You'd every year now, for the last three years, you've done Himalaya treks. Mm -hmm. This is from 2009, I think, some mm -hmm. video from 2009. Right. Uh, John Miller, a friend from Colorado, he, uh, he had spent time in the Himalayas um, to shoot a video documentary. I met him. He brought, he brought me some Tibetan flags. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and he... Another podcaster. He's a podcaster. He, yeah. and, and he and I met through the podcasts because I, I found his show and yeah. I, I, s I sent him an email um, telling me how great I thought this show was and, and then he sent me an email back telling me that, oh, I'm a fan of yours. That's so, great. so we ended up becoming That's friends great. and then he asked me, why, why don't... W how would you like to hold a workshop at Everest Base Camp? Wow. And I was like, I would, I would have never had the idea to do that. Wow. Uh, totally. The, look at me. I'm, 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 not the, I'm not a sporty kind well, of person. <laughs> so, so I, I was... i good at altitude. Yeah, but that, that, was, that was another kind of another uh, uh, pivotal moment for me because it changed a lot of thought process at that point. 
and um, spending time up in the mountains is mm. just it must yeah, be amazing. Kathmandu. It must be amazing. Um, this is from the first one. That's from the. F- it took me about uh, second. 21 second. Hours. Okay. That's the second. No, that's the first one. Yeah. Two thousand nine. Yeah, the yeah. first one. So, yeah, we've done it now for three years. First two times to Everest. The third time we went to Mount Annapurna, which is one of the other big mountains up there. Fun. Um, People spend a lot of money to do this. But they get they get the the time up in the mountains. Right. They get a. F- a basically 24-7 photo workshop. Right. Um, which would be fun. Which, I mean, this is a life-changing event, and, yeah. and even doing it for three times has turned into sti- still one of the things I come back home for. I'm so, I'm so well-grounded when I return. You know, the, 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 all the things we have in our Western culture. Right. Just the luxury of, of showering with <laughs> drinking water. Uh. I mean, in Kathmandu, you, you have keep to your mouth keep closed. your mouth closed yeah. when you shower because yeah. you never know what's, what's in the in the water so it's a very it's a very um sobering thing to go there and 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 see what it's interesting how many photographers travel it it, it seems to be a very natural kind of hand in hand thing i do al- almost all of my photography when i'm traveling i don't have time mm-hmm. to do it the rest mm-hmm. of the time or travel i don't make the time to do on it. the one hand travel is when when you have a lot of time right. um right. to and do you these things because you're seeing things with a new eye yeah right it's you fresh see things with a new eye you see new things new sights new experiences just the people in in the himalayas are just um, oh, so very incredible. different from the people here and yeah so very open um i feel also sometimes it's a crutch because I should be taking pictures all the time, and there's always something. I mean, you wandered out the street. There's 20 great shots, but it's just it's easier in a new place in a new environment. I'm, I, I always try to be, to to. I always want to learn shooting good things in my backyard right. because um, then right. when you go to one of these places, then that's, you're ready. Then you're ready <laughs> to to actually do it. Um, it. I just last night. I was in my hotel room. I saw the the, <laughs> the mess I made, and uh, then I got out my large format camera, set it up, and tried to document that. No, so that's cool. I, I, I'm I'm always in this practice mode. Yeah, I always yeah. am, and I and I've really made it a habit to have a camera with me all the time. You actually, uh, and this is kind of a nice nexus between your programming, uh, you know, your technology and your um, uh, skills and your photography skills. You've got a. I'll see if I can find it. A uh, iPhone app that you've done Pocket called Chris. Pocket Chris. Yeah, how's that doing? Uh, it's a, it's on a bit of a hiatus. There are there are two versions out there. There are three more in preparation. Good. I want to. B- they're basically little. Uh, There's basically Chris in a can. Little yeah, Chris in a can. <laughs> yeah, but little little instructor in your pocket. Um, so you get to um, see different different aspects of photography you get to play with different things and the basic I mean the first one is free that's a basic one um, for example shows you depth of field so you you actually see depth of field by turning a wheel and 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 it it changes so these the are aperture. like little schools little instructional apps sort of it is like. it's, it's, it's it's totally an instructional app I, I looked around and there were so many photo apps that do filters mm-hmm. and, and yeah. oh yeah like I don't I didn't want to compete on that level um, so I thought what's the thing you do best and I I love teaching so I uh, came up with that concept and it's they are very basic actually the 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 text I put in there is I mean I. I, when I write those texts, I have to then spend significant time paring them down to make them right. not too long because right. people on the iPhone don't want to read uh, huge big things. That's that's okay for a book, but that's not okay for an app. So the time that goes in is um, is finding the right examples and um, and then paring the text down and making it work all all in context. Tell me about the invisible camera. <laughs> I'm looking at the video right now. The invisible camera. The invisible okay. camera from the Max Planck Institute. Well, okay. Is this um, a joke? Yes. <laughs> it's a little practical joke. Well, it was in early March that a friend of mine was a video producer, um, Alan Attridge. <laughs> he came up with the idea that we <laughs> could maybe... <laughs> Do something for April first, ah. okay? And 
and then as I, I give full credit to Alan. He's the one who came up with the idea. And um, I am, in fact, building a camera right now. It's a pinhole camera. Which it's is basically uh, this idea. It's, yeah. a, it's a made in Germany, handmade construction <laughs> with beautiful <laughs> custom made metal parts Ooh, and neat. stuff. And based on that, a, a, a pinhole camera, I mean, in the end, it's a, it's a beautiful, but it's a box. Mm -hmm. So we made. Uh, an invisible camera. We came up with the idea of an invisible camera, and it's a camera made. Would it work? Look, there it is. The <laughs> Would it work? <laughs> well, you need film. No, the, the thing is, um, the idea digital. was to come up with this. No, it's not digital. It's film. Okay. Um, the idea was that this camera would. <laughs> well, we, we developed a background story. Okay, let me put it this way. We've developed a background story. It's a light amplification uh -huh. system <laughs> that um, then using spe special film. Invisible film, apparently. No, real film. Oh, okay. uh, you put it on the back. And uh, this special film would then um, only see light, very directional light. So uh -huh. you could handle that in, sp in daylight, basically. Uh -huh. And we How much? Because I want one. <laughs> well, we're not gonna s we're gonna we're not gonna sell it, but um, you and, where, and where would you get the film? In, interestingly enough, we made it so convincing. Actually, we set the video up in a, in a three uh, in a three part. First part is I, put, I talk about it, I explain the concepts. It's based on apparently based on some technology by Jacques Cousteau because he had to do underwater. <laughs> this is all made filming. up. I want I want It's all made uh, up. Yeah. yeah. And then the second part, we show the camera, and it is um, here. Here is a friend who actually runs an analog photography <laughs> shop and he he talks about the special it's film amazing film <laughs> and um the but did people believe this well the third part was then taking it over the top we start right. talking about terapixels and about <laughs> uh <laughs> fractional isos and we, t we talk about we t really take it and toss it over the, over the cliff and at the end we ask people to sign up for a field test right 100 cameras will go out to field testers. And we got 1,400 signos <laughs> in <laughs> one week. Well, I mean, some people probably knew it was a joke and still signed up. Yes, they're absolutely. like, wonder what I'm going to get out of this. Absolutely. I'm pretty sure that uh, a lot of people did that. But I I'm received emails. I'm, I'm not going to name names, but I received emails from professionals in the field. And I'll tell you in why. In the field of photography, I'll in the tell field you why of I brought this effects. up. Because we've, you know, Foveon, Red, yes. Lytro right yes. now. This is not at all unusual in this field that I people know. come out with these amazing revolutions in photography. Absolutely. And some, like the red camera, actually pan out. Uh -huh. Some, like the Foveon, didn't, and even though Carver well, Mead was behind Foveon it. Foveon is a real technology, at yeah, least. Yeah. Oh, it's not, um, it's not an invisible Lytro camera. is apparently a real technology, even though I haven't really seen a... Yeah, you, have you got your hands model? on one? Trey, now, Trey yeah, says yeah, yeah. He, he got his hands one on one, Trey Ratcliffe, but he Did won't he? show us or talk about it. Lytro is, for, for me right now, it's still something I haven't seen yet, so I... Right. This is the camera that takes a picture in multiple planes. Right, and, and, you, and can you can change the focus later on. Right. Which, uh, there is, t t technology is there. There's in actually, principle. There's a German company who has one on the market, but for industrial purposes. So, it's it's there. Um, it's just too expensive right now for consumer use. So, anyway, we, we did that, and we had lots of professionals uh, ask questions about it. I still, every now and then, even though we, we then released the second part of the so video. So, you fooled some people, it sounds like. Yes, and I've got some... Now you got some angry people. <laughs> I got some angry <laughs> responses. They're like, I'm never going to listen to you again. No. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, it, I, I, was, I was ready to take some flack for that. It was fun. It, it, it ended up being a study in media production and storytelling, basically. Mm. That's what it ended up uh, being, storytelling. It's quite a nice documentary. I mean, it's, it's very professional. Oh, and Alan, Alan is, a, is a pro. He, yeah. uh, he and I, we, we set this up in my studio, and we, we gave it really nice <laughs> lighting, and it turned out to, um, to work, to be very convincing. So, invisiblecamera.com. Do you have one with you right now? It's, it's uh, invisible. <laughs> yeah, it's it's right. amazing. I have one right here. <laughs> we should just keep going. Let's just go with the joke. <laughs> no, you said you are working on a pinhole camera, though. And, and that's a real project. That's not an April Fool's joke. Um, the pinhole camera. I'm, I was looking at... I, I was playing with this. I've, I've been going uh, analog. Um, for the last two years, I've been mostly shooting analog when shooting for myself. Client work, obviously, is still digital. Hmm. You need the control, you need the repeatability. But I have, I've fallen back in love with the process, with, hmm. um, with 
handling. Uh, a, I mean, I have. You a want hypo and fixer, and you want an enlarger, and well, I'm not enlarging. I, I go hybrid, so I, I I develop the negatives and then I scan them in and continue oh, okay. in the digital realm because I'm also a child of the digital age. That's an interesting yeah, idea. Yeah. So film negative, yeah. but then you don't d you don't print it. You do that all computer computerized. At least for now, and I, d I don't have a pl any plans to go back into the dark room. I mean, I wanna see daylight. So I all the like all in the, the dark development uh, happens in daylight in in, in light tight uh, development tanks. So that's uh, you can do this without having to be in the dark. And um, people ask me why why do you do that? Why even bother? What, what why just go it? all why, digital? Right. Yeah, what do you get out of the uh, the film? It's it's place? well, it turns into actually the. Working with analog makes me be much more conscious of the process. It helps me be more um, aware of what happens, and it forces me to work a bit more thoroughly. So I end up spending more time with each picture, and I ended up I end up with a much higher yield. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's interesting. When I shoot, this is more careful. I'm much more careful because you can't just yeah. f f snap off a hundred. Well, I still can. I mean. Well, yeah, ten ten rolls of film is, yeah. is not a problem, but I end up I end up uh, being much more careful, and I um, I I really appreciate the process much more. It I end I, I used to be that kind of person um, when you when you ask asked me three years ago, uh, I'd say it's the result that counts, it's the picture that counts. Camera's not important, um, but having worked with a lot of different analog cameras now and, and having uh, really experienced that process again, it is, it changes the way I look at photography and interestingly enough it also filters back into my digital photography. So hmm. I, when I, what you pick up tricks? Up to now, I sh when I shot digital, I, depending on, on what I shot for, I might have had one to five percent yield and the rest is People up, people pictures you you throw away. Um, when I shoot digital, when I shoot analog, I end up with a yield rate of way over fifty percent. Mm -hmm. But that makes sense because I each image is going to cost you money, is more uh, difficult to process. Yes, that, that makes sense. Initially, that's the thing. That's that's the large format camera I've been working on lately. Um, that must be fun. What, how big is the negative on that? That's a four by five inch. Wow, and so that's film as well. That's film. So you you end up with, oh, let's say. But you can when see why you wouldn't get so many shots out of this thing. It's not exactly you put it up to it'll your eye. It'll take you like five to fifteen minutes <laughs> to set to up a shot of that. Yeah, yeah. But you, but you, uh, you end up with with a lot of advantages. But, but is that a virtue to say, well, my my shot ratio is lower. I don't take as many. I get more better shots. You it's also not an advantage. I mean, I could take six thousand shots with a digital camera. I know you. You also get a very different visual language out of these cameras. Okay, see, that's the, what I'm curious about. Because the sensor size or the film so size big, yeah. influences the way you work. For example, on a large format camera, you have a... Wh what your camera has... We, we were talking about this. This is a 35 millimeter, right? Uh, uh, it's APS-C. Yeah, but... So it's not full frame. Yeah, but it's a 35 millimeter. That's roughly normal for, for, yeah. for what we see. Yeah. The, the same type of picture you get from a large format camera with a 150 millimeter lens. Right. So you end up shooting a much longer focal length, mm -hmm. um, still getting the same angle of view, the same field of view, the same impression, but all of a sudden you work with compressed. a very different visual yeah. language, more compressed, yeah. you have another depth of field, right. um, and all of a sudden you you can tell stories in a different way. It's one thing I notice about photographers, they, they and, and computer people too, they experiment. It's a, it's a, a field where it encourages experimentation. Totally. That's how you stay fresh. You try stuff. I do that all the time, and yeah. and uh, and that is just one of the things that helps me um, not not to get too set settled in my path. Right. I want to uh, try out new things. Right. I mean, it's, it's, you are a bit like that. I mean, uh, I, I need to keep busy. I need to. I I, I get easily bored. Yeah. <laughs> Very we share easily. that. Yeah. yeah we so, share that. So I need to start <laughs> something new, and that. Just opening that door into analog photography and into large format photography, um, it's one of these little doors you open and right. then you look inside and it's a huge room full of stuff and right. it's, mm -hmm. it keeps you busy for another few years. It's an interesting trend in all technology too where we find once we've removed all the limits, maybe not all the limits, but a lot of limits, you want we back. realize, Bring you know back. what, some of those limits were helpful. Bring look at back. Twitter, 140 characters. Yeah. No one, that's a limit that they put because yeah. of SMS, but it turned out 
to be useful in a whole other ways, I see a similarity there mm -hmm. of saying, you know what, this limit actually forces me to think in a different way. Right. But, uh, you, but think in a different way you wouldn't have thought if you hadn't played with digital and gone back. I right, think. And, and digital and the, and, the, and the endless choice, the end, I mean, coming home from a trip like the, the Everest trek mm -hmm. um, with three and a half thousand pictures and then playing with them and having all the all the all the choices uh, at least when it comes to white balance and to black and white conversion and 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 a lot of other things um, it's endless it's almost endless but limitation is a good thing I find that over and over when I start to get the creative juices flowing I need limitation I need to um, maybe limit myself to one focal length or I maybe need to limit myself to uh, this roll of 120 film that mm -hmm. lets me shoot 10 shots or I limit myself to mm -hmm. only this one camera for an entire weekend or one color or one, or one color yeah we, we do this uh, or black and white I lo you know I'm starting to really in fact the reason I bought this camera um, the which, X100 which which you you mocked as the diva camera which is actually the best description I've ever heard of it which is it's brilliant but challenging demanding it is, because it it's is Yep. Hard to use. It takes a bit of getting used to, and uh, the, the the pictures, the quality, the image quality you can get out of the camera is it's incredible, beautiful. Yeah. Um, hardware, beautifully done. <laughs> but there are just a few things that that make that it difficult for me. That drive me crazy. I mean, uh, I got. But here's why I got it. This, the whole purpose of getting it was, first of all, it's a not. It's not obtrusive. It looks like I'm a tourist. Yeah. It looks like I'm, in fact, a tourist who has a very old camera. Yeah, like a <laughs> like 70s era. Yeah, right? 60s era. And then it's silent. Listen, I'll take a picture. That was it. You don't yeah, hear, it. hear it. So I want this for street photography. I want to do black and white street photography mm -hmm. in the tradition of the great, you know, street photographers. Brisson. And like Brisson. And, um, and Vivian Meyer. Have you heard of Vivian oh, Meyer? Oh, the Vivian Meyer stuff. Blew. That's what got me into it. Mm -hmm. So do you know the story of Vivian Meyer? No, tell me. She was a nanny in New York City. I think in Chicago. Or oh, Chicago? All right. And uh, back in the back in the sixties. And she would and she go never shared her is that she never yeah, shared her photos. I think I have her took pictures nightmare. every day, hundreds of pictures, without any intent to share them. He, she just loved photography. Mm -hmm. And whenever she had a moment she would go out and take pictures. Well, uh, somebody bought the contents of a storage locker right filled with thousands Hundreds of thousands of negatives and um, he ended up um, I think buying even more from someone else who had some so he has this this some of them undeveloped film uh -huh. developed negatives and it turns out there's some really great photographers. Well, she there. happens to be uh, happened to be a brilliant photographer, She's and nobody knew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yes, that's what actually inspired me to do this. Is I, I was looking at her incredible oh, right. yeah. shots. No, I have seen this. I remember. And I said, I want to shoot in black and white. That is street And the, it's funny. The camera that she used looked very much like this camera. That's a German camera. Is Ron it? I, a Ron Flex. A twin lens reflex camera. Oh, and it was reflex, right? So, she, lens, so, so you so look you, down. You look down on yep. it, and, yep. and uh, actually, I'd love a Rolle, but I don't. I, I don't make know if it I anymore. Can, yeah, but um, I, I really, I really feel that capturing. And now you do workshops on street photography, which I really need to take because it's in, it's intimidating. I mean, that's There's another still reason a standing I got this. Invitation. I know. I really want to do you it. You never have the time. Well, and now this is 35 millimeter. Yeah. So uh, you know, you you actually have to get fairly fairly in close. You're not taking a picture from back here. You're which taking a picture from right here. Which is a good thing in street photography because you want that feeling of being there, and as a as a viewer, you want that feeling of being there and. Uh, a lot of the street photography I see is is from a safe distance mm, with a 200 yeah. millimeter lens. And like you got to be engaged. And and but the pictures will tell you that you look right. at the. And that's why you want the at the, the, at the visual language yeah. and silent. And you yeah. end up and less obtrusive as well. Yeah. I mean, th there are different uh, there are different kinds of street photography. There's also street photography where you walk up to someone, ask them nicely if you could right. take the picture, and um, from a legal point of view, depending on where in the world you are, that is actually the only way you can do it. Um, I think here in the states, we can just take pictures New as long York as it's public, has right? Very liberal laws about that. Okay. So I think one of the best places is New York. Is New York? Well, certainly the most interesting. A lot too. of great yeah. street photographers are in New York. And street photography just means going out on the street, and taking uh, lots of definitions. But in general, I would say go out on the street and uh, take pictures of people in not everyday situations mm -hmm. and oops losing the microphone and that is that's not that easy like this right now you'll have to, yeah, for example, <laughs> not an everyday situation you'll, you'll have to um, if you look through the Vivian Meyer pictures on the website you'll see the 
the, the kind of situations, um, unusual looks or uh, interesting frames around people or and and they are the kind of, they look, look you that. look at them and you think it's these amazing. are the kinds these must have been in a magazine these must never. have been in, a, in, in an exhibition never in even seen in a way. And amazing she never gave them to anybody she never showed anybody it was just for her own in fact she didn't print many of these negatives so I I probably can't even say it was for own, her own enjoyment she was a collector I guess or, or a a hunter, hunter, a she hunter and gatherer the process yeah. of going <laughs> look, look at that shot. I mean yeah. that tells the story <laughs> it's a great shot. It? It just makes you smile. Yeah. So this is what I want to do, and I and yes. I think black and white is kind of great for this. Black and white takes takes a, a whole level of distraction out of a picture. Right. Color adds this this layer on top of photography. Photography used to be black and white only, right. and what that meant you had all the lines and the shapes and the forms and the shadows and the and the the textures, and then. And 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 that's there's certain there's a certain hierarchy of things like bright things in a picture are more important than dark things. Um, leading lines will guide your eye towards something, and then all of a sudden comes color, and color adds a new whole new level of hierarchy but on top so of a picture. Easily warm distracted warm by colors it. are yeah. more important than cool colors. So all of a sudden you have this hierarchy, the 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 contrast hierarchy, that guides your eye towards the bright spots and the and the contrasty things, and all of a sudden comes this second level. That says, oh, and by the way, there's this little red thing back there mm -hmm. that is m way more important than this bright spot on this side because it's red, and all of uh, and all of a sudden, you as a viewer go, oh, wait a minute, what what's this picture about now? And maybe even just subconsciously, um, color mm. makes it good photography. I believe is easier in black and white. For look, look at this shot. I actually use the shot uh, that's on the uh, on the screen right now. I, I use some of Vivian Meyer's pho uh, look photographs at that. in workshops. That's all about shape, texture, contrast, and it tells and a story. story. And it tells and a story. story. And in the end, color might have distracted you. You know. Yeah. In well, the and end, what you're saying is we're trying to we're trying to make some art here. We're not just trying to show you exactly what. Well, I hate there. doing black and white for artiness' sake. You know, I think a lot of people use black and white to say. Make a statement. This is arty. Well, uh -huh. you can't stop there. You can't say because it's in black and white. <laughs> yeah. Now it's arty. It's now it's arty. Yeah. Um, what about sepia tones or, or other? That's still black and white. It's just toning. So, yeah. So you'd be able to to maybe give a picture a bit of a warmish feeling by giving it a, a, a warm tone, or or a more desolate feeling by giving it a cooler uh, tone, and but that is an overall tone. Or actually, you used to have duo tone um, mm -hmm. back in the day of printing, where you would. Well, you have two things in the picture, right? You have the paper and you have the silver. The silver is the black part. Mm -hmm. So you could independently tone those two. You could have, for oh, example, a warm paper and then a cool silver tone on it. And this way, um, create a bit of a tension there between uh, cool and, and warm colors. Or vice versa, you could have a cooler paper and a warm tone silver. Um, so give me some advice, because I want to do more street photography. Um, the problem is we're here in this small town. I don't know if I could get very much interesting street <laughs> that, photography that, here. That's why I do these workshops in Berlin or yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah. You need to be in a city. Yeah. <laughs> helps. Helps, helps a lot. A lot. Um, do you ask permission? Uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Right. Because my problem with asking permission is it calls their attention to the fact that you're about to take a picture yeah. and they pose. You've changed the conditions yeah. of the. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you. Heisenberg yeah. uncertainty principle. Exactly. Is yeah. You have you have to. I, I, I call the workshop, sometimes I call them therapy because I get to force people it's to actually very go difficult. out and do it because it is so you, difficult. You, have to do, I, you have to get over a certain hurdle to actually do it and go out and get close to someone. Um, what really works well is if you don't give people the impression that you're dealing with them. So when when I take mm -hmm. when I okay, take a go picture, ahead. go ahead, we'll do this. Let me let me try that. You be. And by the way, the other reason I got this is it's a rangefinder that you're looking directly through the rangefinder, and there's a certain immediacy oh. to that than through a single lens it's reflex. It's an optical viewfinder. It's That's an optical viewfinder. I don't like. I don't like. Now you like have an LCD on it. It's yeah. hard. You you do, and so you can do that. And there even is a uh -huh. hybrid mode with video. Which gives you a more accurate reproduction of what you're seeing, because the crop is hard to do right. in a optical viewfinder. It's not going through the both. lens. But I like the optical because you feel like you're in the scene, you're there, and so for for street photography, I it's think much it's much more immediate. Yeah, it's clearly more imme immediate. The so show, show me the trick. Well, the you're pretending that you're going to take a picture of something behind Tom's ear. Okay, Tom. Um, <laughs> I'm actually. <laughs> 
I've just taken a picture of you. I've not even right. looked at you. Yeah, yeah. Um, You're definitely so look off the, over his shoulder. Here you go. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, it's a bit out of focus. There. Okay, <laughs> that's well, by the way, diva camera, hardest thing in the world. Yeah, you gotta, yeah. It's yes, tricky. But but th that is one of the best things that I have um, learned about street photography is to look somewhere else. Th that yeah. is, and then aim it at me. Right, right. I haven't even looked at you. I looked right. at you through the viewfinder. You look like you're kind of crazy, to be honest with you. I am. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, some video Why are you from, taking your, a picture of that post, from your sir? Berlin uh, workshop as you're as you're taking people around uh, oh, yeah. the city of Berlin and uh, Berlin. We um, we ended. Uh, we we managed to get a tour at the uh, Tempelhof Airport, which is the airport of the Berlin airlift. Right. And right. It's, it's right in the middle, in the heart of the city. Mm. And it has been shut down years ago. And it's now. Look at this. Oh, what fun. the old bunkers under oh, the wow. airport. What fun. So, um, getting that behind the scenes tour for photographers, uh, that was quite something. Yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. Yeah. Have you done the wall? Or what's, what's the left of it? I, I hear they're actually putting more of it back. They're like spending millions. I have a piece of it if they euros need it. To, to well, I was in Berlin. I bought a couple of pieces. Yeah, well, I need some myself. back. I could bring it back. It was just that. a 50 year anniversary of the wall. Was it? Yes. Yeah. Of, being, um, of it being built. Of it no. being built. Is that really? Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've been um, on the workshops that I do in Berlin. Um, that is always part of it. But it's not much left. But what they have in Berlin is they have this, this um, line of cobblestones all the way through mm. and around Berlin where the wall used to be. So you still right. have a very good That's idea right. uh, where the wall was and and how it literally cut through the city. Right. It's pretty amazing. And in fact, if you look at East Berlin, I don't know how it is now, but uh, even a few years ago, it's very clearly East Berlin. East Berlin has actually seen quite a boom because a lot of investment went into East Berlin. So uh, in some areas, East Berlin is now in much nicer, better shape huh? than West Berlin. For a while, it felt very Soviet. It yes, felt it very was, grim yeah. and industrial and institutional. I remember I was in East gray. Germany back in, nine, uh, in 87. Mm. Um, it was a very, very impressive thing because it was so very different. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And yet right next door. Right next door. Yeah. What do you want to take pictures of that you haven't taken? What, what do you want to do next? Where do you want to go? Well, there's still a few places I want to see, uh, places I want to travel. Uh, one is Japan. I've never been to Japan. Would be an incredible place to take pictures. Yeah. Um, and a good thing is I have a photographer friend there, Martin Bailey, um, who I just interviewed on Tips from the Top Floor. And he uh, he's a Brit who, l who has been living in Japan for many years. Uh, so it helps to have a, I, I need to visit uh, a local, doesn't it? When you're, oh yes, when you're doing absolutely. Something like that. Uh, haven't been to Australia. Haven't been to mm. New Zealand. No, so th there are lots of. I've only been to the South Island, New Zealand, but that is a place for photography. It is gorgeous, yeah. and and especially landscape photography. I yeah. think. Um, and looking looking at the or I mean or sheep photography. Or sheep, yeah. One of the two. The large format photography is. I mean that that landscape it's it's made for landscape. Oh yeah. So you, you not not only do you get to um shoot on a on a 4 by 5 inch medium which by the way when scanned will give you even off a ch off a cheap flatbed scanner will a cheap flatbed scanner will give you 200 megapixels or more. So it's a massive amount of data. Mm -hmm. uh, not only that but you have all the tools that a landscape photographer needs. You can you can tilt and shift the the lens and and change the focal plane so uh, in, instead of having to shoot with a ridiculously small aperture to get everything in focus, um, you get to tilt the focal plane forward hmm. onto the landscape. So all of a sudden you can shoot the entire landscape from all the way close to far huh. uh, in focus and the out of focus areas will be above and below. And below doesn't yeah. matter, and above yeah. only matters when there are like big poles and things in the way. So you end up with a lot of uh, freedom. And um, a friend of mine actually used to call it anarchy because you get to, in in a, in an SLR context or in a traditional camera context, everything's fixed. You have a fixed film plane. You have a fixed lens. The distance between lens and film plane is fixed, and it's all parallel. And then uh, all of a sudden you change that, and it gets all fluid, and mm -hmm. um, that you can go where you want to go. Well, and that creates whole new challenges in terms of learning about photography, mm -hmm. and then taking that back into digital. Um, my favorite lens now on my DSLR is a tilt shift lens because yeah. it gives me a bit of that flexibility of 
playing with a focal plane, playing with uh, with perspective and correcting those. As, 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 oh. It's really fun. <sighs> it's really fun. This is a picture I took, in one of my favorite pictures in Berlin. Oh. They had that's the Brandenburg Gate, and they had put up a big poster of what it looked like right at the end of World War II. Yeah. And I told my son, run over there and look sad. <laughs> And, uh, and he did. And he did. <laughs> he, f he fit right in. But you know what? That is that. If, if okay, it's 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 a it's a set picture. You you. It's a posed picture. Oh, it's very posed. But it's a good picture because you you combine this big Brandenburg Gate photo, which is the first thing that caught my attention. Right. The contrast and the bright spots in there. And then after a while, I started noticing mm -hmm. your son there. And he's in color, so... I should spend some time in Lightroom to bring him up a little bit. And, of course, the horses are the real Brandenburg Gate up above. Yeah, it's good. It's a good photograph. Picture. It was fun. Well, it's not a great picture. I just wanted to show you because it's one of my memories of Berlin. That and uh, I think I have one of Henry at Checkpoint Charlie. Oh. At Checkpoint Charlie, which is, which is just a few actors now. and it, it, It's pretty uh, fake. Here's, <laughs> Hen here's Henry at, uh, at Checkpoint Charlie as one of the actors, I think. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. That yeah, was how you got through the There's not much left of Checkpoint Charlie. No, <laughs> snack alas, no. Charlie, right next to it. Yeah, yeah snack, snack Charlie. Subway, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the subway. Right. Do you uh, do any camera phone uh, photography? Um, I use my camera phone every now iPhone? and then. The iPhone four. Somebody, um, Judah, Judah Zuck was asking in our chat room about the N8, the Nokia N8, which has like a Zeiss lens. I mean, we were talking it. about the N93. Haven't tried it. I'll lend you mine. I, just, <laughs> I, I have one. It's not. It's a great camera. It's 12 megapixels. It's yeah. a Zeiss lens. But it's a terrible phone. Although I guess they have an update to the uh, Symbian coming out. Soon, I'm pretty so. happy with the iPhone 4. It's pretty and, amazing, and with isn't this it? Camera. That's uh, what's one of the best iPhone of, of the best mobile phone cameras it's, that I've ever. It's seen. remarkable. Yeah. And yeah. I don't even I don't even use the HDR function that much. It's just the way the way it works by default is very very good. Would if you recommend that? To, I think a lot of people turn it on because they hear, oh, HDR, it's better. I'm going to leave it on. But you're using up more space. Do you, do you get? anything back from that well you, you get a higher dynamic range you it basically takes two pictures mm -hmm. merges them right. and, um, and and gives you I mean a camera with a sensor that size actually has not more than four or five stops of dynamic range f stops and so it's tricking you DSLR is like f five to seven stops mm -hmm. maybe um, and then using two pictures, you can extend that. And um, the HDR that comes out of the iPhone looks very natural. So it's a, it's a good form of HDR. There are some apps that do it even better, but um, it's okay. It's mm. good. Do you do HDR um, with your... Uh, with your st I do HDR every now and then, but I, I actually don't use it as an effect. Yeah. So I, I don't want to do the... You the, don't want to the look the like HDR. Uh, right, right. That what, what's today called HDR, those, those heavily tone map pictures with uh, right. exaggerated colors and, and contrasts that are just not natural anymore, right. where you have a dark sky and a bright foreground. And um, What I tend to do is I use HDR more to extend the dynamic range in a very inc inc inconspicuous way. Right. I try to just get a bit more, like, like for example, on a sunny day and there's this beautiful area, but it's in the shade and the camera can't capture that, so it would clog up the, the dark area and make it black. Um, I would get some more detail in this area, for example. But that's where I, where I'm totally in love with analog photography again. Mm -hmm. You get much uh, broader. Uh, well, there, there are just there are just a few tricks there that that really um, love these change pictures. a few things. For example, uh, there is infrared black and white film, mm -hmm. yeah, which doesn't only see infrared; it actually sees the entire visible range plus some infrared. Oh, okay. If you used an infrared filter basically blocked out the visible light, sure. you would get only infrared light. But if you use the entire range and shoot, you will all of a sudden get, for example, detail in the shadow areas because that's where the infrared light comes in. in there, yeah. So so you end up with a beautiful black and huh. white with more detail in the shadows. Um, a digital camera won't be able to do that because it has a infrared block in there. Are it these has a filter in that. Are these black out. and whites on your uh, web page? Are these... Uh, that's large format. Large it's format film, five, yeah. yeah. You really can tell, can't you? There's so much detail. And it, the amazing thing that I find is even on web resolution, I mean, look at that. Even even when it downsized rich. for the web, you get a lot more detail. It I mean, it, it's, a bit, it's a bit like shooting in SD or HD right. video. Mm -hmm. right. The HD video, even if downsized to SD, will still look still more crisp better. and more, yeah. more vivid. You had more information to start with. Yeah, yeah. So, so the... That's one of the things that I love large format photography about. And if you look at those pictures, they all 
you, it's so easy to correct. Actually, actually, it's full automatic almost to correct perspective. The camera has a has a, has bubble levels in, so the camera is going to be parallel to the buildings. Well, mm -hmm. here's and an example of uh, a, f a forced perspective that just <coughs> <laughs> that is not that's large a fish format. Angle. That's a, that's fish, a fish fish <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a medium format camera. It's yeah. uh, six by six centimeters. Uh, with uh, this is what I love about Chris. It, it's all over the place. You don't stop with any. In fact, show us what you're doing with the LX3 here. This is kind of interesting. Well, the LX3, okay. This, this is, is a p point and shoot. But no, it was a good Panasonic point and shoot. It's a good point and shoot. Yeah. Uh, it still is. I mean, now we're at the LX5, and it's a point and shoot camera that um, is actually, th that was one of the first ones that they lowered back from like 15 megapixels down to 10 megapixels. Right. It's 24 uh, uh, millimeter. It's a 24 so it's a slightly wide. It's a wide angle. And um, I've been using it like as it. my point and shoot camera, but lately I've been more using it with a little extender lens, which is a which makes it into a, an 18 millimeter lens, hmm. equivalent to a 35 millimeter camera. So it's 18 millimeters. That's fairly wide, not fisheye, but wide. And I use it to shoot video. Yeah, because this does good 720p video. This does 720p video, 16 by 9. Um, sound now yeah, okay not that good but um, to do a quick documentary on a workshop or I've shot some video in here so you're I'll, really still doing I'll the same online. thing you were doing with the <laughs> N93 way yeah. back when uh, only now he's doing it with the LX3 say hi to the <laughs> hey everybody uh, we're here at uh, the beautiful uh, exactly. Twit Brick House <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is I I mean, I, I use the tool for the job that right. does the job, and this camera is so small, still has good image quality. Why should I use anything else? It does the job. So I'm, I've, I've, I've been so bored by the new cameras that come out because they're always just incremental, two more megapixels, yeah. little feature A, little feature B more. Um, I'm still waiting for the revolution, the next revolution to well, come. Well, it seems like the category, especially in point and shoot, has matured. It has, and, and they are down to, to the to the 10 to 12 megapixels because that's where the ratio between noise and uh, and the image quality is good enough, mm -hmm. and you don't actually seriously for most photography 10 megapixels is plenty. Um, I've heard people say five is plenty. Yeah, is I shoot I shoot 5D Mark II, 21 megapixels. Um, I have very few situations where I actually need that, and a raw file on, on the 5D Mark II is 25 megabytes. Uh, yeah, which I mean, used to be huge, but is yeah. Yeah, but but still, I mean, um, I'm I'm actually kind of happy with uh, some simpler tools. Yeah, it's good we could get you back after the TriCaster disaster. Here was the uh, <laughs> the picture you took of me after the TriCaster died three years ago, trying to fix it on the fly. That was such a weird. I mean, I mean, I, w I was very happy to be in the Twit Cottage <laughs> and. Um, and we talked photography, <laughs> and uh, it was it was really cool. And all of a sudden, boom! Tri it just died. It just died. It died. And you <laughs> tried very tried hard to, to get it to get it uh, fixed. And <laughs> <laughs> that's a very sorry sorry for that picture. <laughs> no, I love it. And I'm glad that we have it. And then I think you you plugged the FireWire camera into this into the stream, so you could get we something could at least out get something out of it. And this is still lives on the air, by the way. And and that has that is three years ago. Come a long and just way, baby. seeing how much has changed in these three years is <laughs> Leo on the ground. I don't have to do that floor. anymore. In fact, it's probably best that I don't, to be honest with you. <laughs> Chris, it's so great to have you in studio. I, I love talking to you in Tubingen and I'm grateful all I could around be the here. world. But to have you uh, visit is really wonderful. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for and, having uh, me. You, you're doing a workshop in the Bay Area this weekend, right? Is that why you're here? I'll be doing a workshop this weekend um, about oh, one that is very compatible with my day and night rhythm. It's the night and fire photography workshop. Oh, what fun! So next weekend we uh, we're gonna be at um, at Colleen's warehouse. Oh, oh, cool! And we'll have some fire artists from Burning Man oh, Festival fantastic. to perform for us. We'll um, learn about extreme exposures, long time exposures, fire swirls. Burn exposures. Kind of well, <laughs> well, hopefully not. I guess, I guess we have a fire extinguisher there. Yeah, yeah. Um, They're safe. And then on the second oh, night, yeah. we are Colleen's there. How could it not be safe? Yeah. <laughs> In the second night, we're going to have a, uh, to rent a minibus and drive through. Uh, 
San Francisco and try to get some good cityscapes Great. and some some impressive uh, night photography. So cool. Discoverthetopfloor.com if you want to know more. Chris Marquardt's website is chrismarquardt.com. M-A-R-Q-U-A-R-D-T. Well done. And uh, he'll, he'll be back on the tech guy and uh, I'm sure many times more. Who knows, in three years we might even be somewhere better than this. Uh, I don't yeah. see how that's possible. Well, if you, need to, if you want to extend this to Germany, let me know. That's a good idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a good idea. This show today was brought to you by our friends at Netflix. If you're not yet a Netflix member, $7.99 a month and unlimited streaming. Abby, come here. Do you watch Netflix? Abby watches. Abby, my daughter has been working uh, over the summer as our receptionist. And you know what she does while she's sitting at the front desk? She watches Netflix <laughs> She's movies. Like, Shh, don't tell the oh you're the boss. Don't tell dad. Oh. Uh, Netflix is great. Seven ninety nine unlimited. If you're not a member, Netflix.com slash twit. We've got a thirty day trial waiting for you. If you are a member, please do us a favor. If you like the show, tell your friends, tell your family, tell anybody who doesn't have Netflix yet about this great deal. They'll thank you and we thank you. Netflix.com slash twit. Chris, great to see you. Thank you so much thank for having me. Thank you so much, and we'll see you again real soon. Tom Merritt. Thanks for being um, here. Thank you all for you, watching. Chris. We do triangulation when we can. I think we've got a guest for next Wednesday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's 2200 UTC at live.twit.tv. And you can always capture the show uh, after the fact uh, at twit.tv slash TRI. It's on iTunes everywhere you can get a video. Uh, have a great, uh, great night, and we'll see you next time on Triangulation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.